there never was a benign feminism that was ever not really, really angry and ever not interested in destroying the social order in order to remake it in a, in a utopian guise. Hello, and welcome to the Renaissance of Men podcast. My name is Will Spencer. My guest this week is Dr. Janice Fiamengo, and she's a retired professor, author, YouTuber, and former radical feminist. She came of age at a time when the most extreme feminist rhetoric was reaching a fever pitch, when feminism was young, hip, and edgy, and when culture wasn't aware of the threat and couldn't protect women from it. So Janice drank it in, until a series of realizations decades later made her question whether what she believed was really true or accurate, and whether it mapped to reality. She then started blowing the whistle on what the feminists were saying behind the scenes, in their own words. I'll let her tell the story, but I think you'll hear reflected in it the kind of moral and intellectual courage more men and women need today. In this conversation, Janice and I discussed her journey and awakening, sentimental versus political feminism, the white feather campaign, the arsonism and bombing done by suffragettes, feminist exterminationism of men. And finally, we unpack and disarm the phrase rape culture. If you enjoy the Renaissance of Men podcast, thank you. Please like this video, share it, and subscribe. Plus, leave a comment down below letting us know how you unplugged from feminism. And please welcome this week's guest on the Renaissance of Men podcast, Dr. Janice Fiamengo. Hey, Janice, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast. Well, Will, thank you very much for having me on your program. Yeah, we connected, it would have been a couple years ago, uh, right about now. And I, um, uh, through, I believe it was Warren Farrell, perhaps. And, uh, and he, uh, he told me about your background and some of the things that you had been through. And you recommended a book, uh, to me that I just recently read that I want to get into called The Scum Manifesto by Valerie Solanus, which we'll get to. But for the benefit of my listeners, I wonder if you could just start by running through a little bit of your history with feminism and kind of where you are right now, just so you can paint the picture better than I can. Okay, yeah, I'll try not to make this too long because it could sure, take sure. up our entire thing. Um, of course. Yeah, basically, I you know I was an academic. I I was a I wanted from the time you know I was even in still in high school. I knew I wanted to teach English literature, so I I went to the University of British Columbia. I started studying literature. I did a BA there, then I did a master's degree in literature. I took a few years out to teach, but then I decided I wanted to do a PhD. You know, go whole hog. And uh, so I did that. And the study of English literature, like most of the humanities and social sciences, you know, by the late 1980s, early 1990s, it was being flooded with all of the um, standard kind of uh, leftist high theory ideas about transforming the world, you know, cultural revolution, uh, the ideas of the cultural Marxists that, you know, all oppressed and marginalized groups needed to band together to make revolution, to change people's consciousness, to change society. All of that was was in full swing, especially in 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 the, I'd say, humanities departments, probably more than any other, maybe. Mm -hmm. So 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 Marxist theories eco-critical theories, certainly uh, feminism, uh, you know, all of those kind of social justice theories were the dominant ideology that I encountered. And um, I found it very attractive. So uh, as I think, you know, many idealistic uh, or even not that <laughs> idealistic young right. people do, you know, it sounds great. It's all about uh, ending all injustice, which can be done because it begins with the idea that human nature is entirely socially constructed and malleable. So it can be remade. You can remake the conditions of society and remake humanity at the same time. And, and that sounds very attractive. And I never really heard, I don't think I heard any, um, any arguments that were taken seriously against that view. So I became quite a, I'd say a radical feminist in my mid to late twenties. It wasn't based on any experience of ever having felt, you know, in any way oppressed, marginalized, made to feel inferior. I'd had nothing but encouragement from male teachers and mentors. My, you know, my dad expected that I would do whatever I 
set my mind to do if I had the talent and the self-discipline and the focus to do it. Both my parents encouraged me to go to school and, you know, to make my contribution to the world. So that was my background. So I'm not sure why. Well, I do know, I think, but I, I <laughs> right. it's, it's embarrassing in a way to admit how fully I um, was attracted to revolutionary radical feminist ideas, which always involved the notion of the male oppressor, even though I had never encountered any male oppressors in my life. Um, but it, it is a very attractive philosophy, I think, um, particularly for women, because it offers this, you know, this sense of exhilarating rebelliousness, uh, authenticity, um, being excused from all blame because the history of your sex has been the history of valiant women striving against their oppression. And um, so, yeah, I, I, and because I think also everybody around me accepted that as a legitimate position, I didn't get any pushback. In fact, I got a lot of encouragement um, to read literature from that perspective. So that was what I started to do. And um, I wrote a feminist thesis. I did my comprehensive exams in literary criticism. That was one of the, the major fields that I, that I uh, was examined in. And, and that included a very large dose of feminist literary theory. And that meant that you read everything through that lens. You read women's texts differently from how you read men's texts. You read women's texts to find those revolutionary seeds, you know, to find evidence that the woman writer was resisting her um, socialization as a woman. You read every man's uh, stories or poetry as as either as evidence that he himself was self-critical in which you would uh, in that case you would approve him or you would read uh, the text as evidence that he accepted patriarchal ideology and was affirming and complicit in it so you know I, I did all of that and I write a I wrote a PhD thesis on Canadian women writers of the 19th century and early 20th century which involved a again, reading a lot in feminist history, since Canadian feminists were interested in what was going on in England and the United States at the same time. And eventually I turned that into a book. But by the time I was turning into it into a book, I was starting to question some of it. And mm. that happened when I started teaching, because I just couldn't help but see that there I was standing up talking about women's oppression and the need to value women's voices and, and, you know, male privilege and entitlement. And I was teaching to a class, to classrooms that had 85% women in them in a university that had 60% women in them in which there was no oppression going on and in which women were privileged in all sorts of ways with special scholarships and special attention paid to them and discussions about rape culture and the you know, obvious valuing of women's voices. And when women made accusations, they were very carefully listened to and they were celebrated for their courage in coming forward, you know, and all of that. And, and I could see that the men were far from being privileged, were pretty, seemed kind of tentative and, uh, either were, were completely good-hearted and accepted feminist postulates and were very interested in what their female colleagues had to say and supported feminism, or were, were seemed a little bit ashamed and uncertain and, and kind of embarrassed and, and, and hesitant to speak in class if these issues came up, which they always did. Mm -hmm. And I started to think about what it was like to be a young guy who had had nothing to do with patriarchal oppression in his life, if it had even existed, because I did right. begin to wonder, you know, how did we get to where we are, where feminism became this, this, you know, the dominant ideology and where feminism became a very um, highly respected uh, academic discipline, if there was so much resistance and there were all these patriarchs who um, didn't take women seriously and didn't see women as fully human, how could it have been that the feminist revolution was so quickly successful? Um, mm -hmm. So, but yeah, I, but focusing on those individual men, I, 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 yeah, I started to wonder how lousy it must be to have to, to come to university as an 18 or 19 or maybe in your early 20s 
young man and have to listen in class after class to how your sex was somehow uniquely responsible for everything that was wrong in the world and to have to bear that burden of guilt on your shoulders and in response have to be absolutely quiet or at least accept everything that was told to you about the pernicious history of your sex and accept that you were simply going to have to take a, a step back or 10 steps back and let your sisters come forward and rule the world from now on because they were morally superior, were responsible for no evil, were um, better because they were more collectivist in their approach, they were more empathetic, they were more nurturing, they uh, were more egalitarian. And so you were supposed to let them come forward to take charge of society and improve it so much. And so that was when I really started questioning. And I, I wrote a book about the figures that I had studied in my dissertation. And I kind of changed the focus and the perspective. It was still a feminist book, I think. But it, it my, my point was that here were women starting in the 1860s and 1870s who were able to come forward as writers, as educators, as um, religious teachers, even there were, you know, business owners and, and everything else at that time. But I was looking at women who made names for themselves as essayists and novelists and journalists and public performers and advocates for various causes, including the temperance cause. And they were able to speak. They were listened to with respect and they had an impact on their world. And part of the, the power of what they had to say came from the fact that they were women. So the notion that they were second class citizens and subordinate to men didn't actually correspond to the obvious agency and ability to affect public affairs that these women demonstrated. So yeah, that, so that was my point. It, I was still interested in gender and women's particular experiences, but I was no longer really interested in seeing women as marginalized in their societies. And so that, that all happened, you know, my book was published in 2008, I think it was called the woman's page. And, um, from that point on, I would say I was, although I wouldn't have said I was an anti-feminist, I was skeptical of, of many feminist claims. And I started seeing myself as, uh, I, I just didn't think feminism was very relevant anymore to my personal life or the kind of teaching that I wanted to do. And then it wasn't until 2011, I think, maybe, two, well, 2012 specifically, I saw the protest against Warren Farrell when he mm. came to the University of Toronto in the fall of 2012, he came to speak about the boy crisis. And there was a hysterical protest outside of the building in which he was to speak, in which uh, students in a women's studies class or a number of women's studies classes tried to block the entrance ways to, to get into the building. They tore down the posters. They claimed that he was an apologist for rape. Uh, they obviously knew nothing whatsoever about him, but they had been uh, encouraged by their women's studies professors to come out and protest this man who dared to speak up on behalf of boys and young men. And that was so disgusting and ridiculous to me that I, at that point, contacted the Canadian Association for Equality, which was the organization that had arranged for Farrell to come to Toronto and I said I was interested in what they were doing. They were essentially an organization that was trying to raise men's issues in a non-confrontational manner. And I said I would love to be involved with them in some way, especially I thought, you know, if there were young men at the university, I was in Ottawa at that time, if there were young men at the University of Ottawa who might want to just come to talk to me about you know, situations they were experiencing in their classes. I thought maybe I could be a bit of a mentor to men who were just tired of being told how rotten they were. So, and, and so at, and at that point, Cafe asked me to speak. And I, I, uh, I did speak in Toronto in the spring of 2013. 
I think it was mm -hmm. March the 7th or 8th. It was right around International Women's Day. And I gave a talk and of course it was protested and the fire alarm was pulled and, you know, people were outraged that I was there, uh, you know, making the campus unsafe for women because I dared to raise questions about the truth of feminism. And because I was interested by that point in, in the problems that were facing young men. And so that was mm. the beginning of my journey. Wow. So as Sorry, you, that so did end up being kind of long. No, <laughs> no, that's, that's absolutely perfect. Cause that context is, it's really vital. It's really vital to understand that you, know, you had spent decades in this world and it wasn't until 2008, 2010, you know, around that time that things started to shift for you. Um, and so after spending so much time in, in the feminist and the radical feminist world, earning your PhD in it, doing so much writing, and then you started to see that maybe not everything was as it seemed as the narrative was portrayed. It's an enormous leap of courage to step out of that and be like, Hey guys, have you thought about this? And to, I, I can only imagine the blowback that you've personally dealt with. Maybe you can talk a little bit about that kind of leaving that. I guess I might say cult. I don't really know what else, what other word to use about it. Yeah, it was a gradual process of leaving. And um, I, I didn't have a bad experience, really. Um, oh, thank God. I, I definitely felt that when I started my video series, um, I had a video series called The Fiamengo File that started in 2015. I met up mm -hmm. with Steve Brule, who had mm -hmm. actually been at Warren Farrell's the protest for Warren Farrell's talk. He had no idea that it was going to go as as radically uh, wrong as it did. But he he uh, he went and got his camera equipment and uh, he he filmed the protest and and set that up on his his uh, new channel. And the the filming of the the, the film of the protest went viral. So um, so. Then I got in touch with him or he got in touch with me after I spoke at Queen's University in Kingston, which is where he was living at the time. And he said, why don't you do a video series about men's issues and feminism? And uh, so that, yeah. And so then I started to actually go through feminist ideology and try to explain it from a feminist skeptical position and from a male positive position. And mm -hmm. I, I tried to explain terms like gender and their history, you know, terms like lived experience and systemic discrimination and microaggressions and rape culture. I, I, I tried to get into where those terms had come from, how they developed and what was wrong with them as I saw it. And at that point, I, I felt the uh, kind of freeze out a bit from my colleagues. Uh, I could tell that those who had seen those videos weren't very happy with them. Mm -hmm. But really, like other than that, I, I'd say my colleagues were always very civil and, and decent to me. I, I did have a few complaints from students, like a couple of student groups tried to tried to get me fired as they do. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they complained about me. Um, they couldn't find that much. And I, and, and the fact that I was a woman was, the thing that protected me. It's very difficult to get a woman fired for complaint for, because she, you know, criticizes feminism. If I had been a man uh, with the exact same video series and giving the talk, the public talks that I was giving, somebody would have cooked up a more serious kind of complaint. They, a student group would have said that I created a hostile environment in my classrooms or that I said, undermining and offensive things to female students in the privacy of my office. That's what they mm -hmm. do. Mm -hmm. And there would have been no way for that man to defend himself against the charges. And he probably would have been quietly retired or publicly, you know, outed as has happened to many, many professors over the last 10 years or so. So I was lucky in that way. And, and uh, I'm still not certain that something like that wouldn't have happened ultimately. Um, but I retired in 2019 because I felt I didn't really have a place at the university anymore. And I did feel nervous about all sorts of things. The university now is such an ideologically rigid place that anyone who 
is seen to dissent from any aspect of the ideology will ultimately be hunted down and there will be moves made by radical student groups to have that person's life, at least have their life made very, very difficult, if not get them fired altogether. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that seems to be the picture that's portrayed of only by the unanimity of all the voices that come out of academia nowadays, that they all yeah. seem to be completely in lockstep and no, no dissent is tolerated. And probably only the thin slender read of tenure from a few remaining professors is what allows dissenting voices in at all. At all. Yeah. And even that like tenure used to actually mean something. It, it, it existed precisely to allow researchers and scholars to say things that were outrageous, uh, you mm -hmm. know, to, to engage in, in very um, polarizing kinds of discussions in the pursuit of truth and, and knowledge and new, um, you know, research perspectives, but that absolutely isn't the case anymore. And, and tenure actually isn't much of a protection at all. All you mm -hmm. need is that complaint by some students saying that you have, made them feel scared or you've harassed them in some way and, and uh, your union won't support you and, and you'll soon find yourself um, facing disciplinary action. Mm -hmm. You listed a number of different terms, you know, like systemic, you know, oppression and gender. And the way that I think about these terms is I call them shaming weapons. Like I've read a lot of the early feminist literature, which has like, this very stiff, dry academic, it's like kind of clubbing someone over the head with a rock. But then I look at terms like toxic masculinity and rape culture as taking those rocks and refining them down to like arrow points mm -hmm. and then launching them through social media. So that's how I, mm -hmm. that's how I think about them. And so what I try to do is I try to blunt some of these, some of these weapons, you know, I try to, I try to chip the point, the sharp point off of them. So I wonder if you can unpack, I think the, the ones that you listed, the one that I think my listeners might look most like to hear your insight on is rape culture because that is so hypercharged and I don't hear too many other people talking about it. I wonder if we can unpack that term and maybe try to blunt the tip of it. Well, the, the, the term, it's a brilliant term, like so many of them are. Yeah. And, uh, it, I, I actually, I can't remember now. I, I know I did read up on the, the origin of it. I can't remember by whom and when it was first formed, but it very neatly encapsulates the idea that we live in a culture that doesn't object to rape, but that actually condones and even encourages it. And that in all sorts of ways, allegedly, young men receive the message from their culture, from, from other men, from popular culture, uh, from if from everything that they they read and see that rape is a rite of passage for men that rape is a uh you know a, an entitlement we're told that there is locker room talk in which men boast of their sexual conquests and are encouraged to do so and affirmed for that in ways that show that they disregard a woman's um you know, uh, dignity, that they don't care whether she gives consent or not. Uh, and, and, um, yeah, and, and it's, so it's a way of, it shifted, um, conversations about rape in ways that I think were very useful for feminist ideologues, because when rape was first widely discussed, I mean, rape had always been seen as a very serious crime. Mm -hmm. Um, it was punished by, by death, it was a capital crime for many, many, many years. That yeah. would seem to indicate that the culture takes it pretty seriously. Um, and so at, at first, what, what feminists wanted to talk about was the, the way in which women weren't believed when they reported their rape or um, the way in which certain uh, contexts in which rape took place made the culture at large minimize the harm to women. They talked about date rape, for example. Mm -hmm. But it wa that wasn't enough because what feminists found was that the vast, vast majority of people were very willing to agree that rape was a heinous 
crime, you know, men uh, as well as women were very quick to say it was absolutely unacceptable and that it was a terrible thing committed by aberrant individuals. And that was a kind of dead end in a way for feminists. So I think they developed this notion of rape culture because that was something that could then encompass a much wider uh, range of actions, sayings, inaction, and all men then could become complicit in it because they didn't like the fact that men could say, hey, I, I would never rape anyone. I find it repugnant. I can't even imagine wanting to do such a thing. That They didn't like that, that men had an out and could so quickly agree that rape was wrong. So rape culture then was a way of saying that all men were complicit in this thing. And I think it starts really with Susan Brown Miller. She wrote a book in 1978, if I'm remembering, called Against Our Will. And mm -hmm. in her thesis in that book was that rape was the means by which all men kept all women in a state of fear and subordination. She said that rapists, far from being, uh, you know, like these just antisocial criminals, rapists were, um, they were like the shock troops for patriarchy, acting on behalf of patriarchy in order to terrorize women and make them so afraid that they would be more obedient to men. So she claimed that all men benefited from the fact of rape, even if they never raped themselves. And that sort of became the origin of the idea of rape culture, was that it was something that benefited men because it made women much more cautious around men, you know, afraid to annoy a man because you never knew when his gentle love might turn violent and, and predatory. So, and, and, you know, that idea that all men actually prefer to be in a position where women in general and their woman in particular, if they have a wife or a lover, that their woman in particular would be afraid of them. That, that assumption that, that most men or even all men prefer that was really simply taken for granted. Like Brown Miller never tries to prove that. She has no you know, survey data or any kind of psychological studies to say that men want women to fear them. She simply asserted that and it was accepted. The book is, you know, it was a New York Times number one bestseller. It was celebrated. Everyone said it was a, you know, bold, new and, you know, very important, uh, new picture of, of sexual relations and of the cultural meaning of rape. And then that got developed even more in the 1980s by um, people like uh, Catherine McKinnon and Andrea Dworkin to say that every man had to bear the shame of the existence of rape. Andrea Dworkin wrote a, an essay in, a, in about 1983 called I Want a 24-Hour Truce during which there is no rape. And, and she published this in a collection of essays and she used to read it out at, uh, at uh, gatherings on, on um, take back the night marches, things like that. She, I think she initially wrote it for a gathering of, of a men's group, um, like a feminist men's group called, you know, men changing, men looking to the future, men, men leading the charge for change, something like that. So there here were 500 men gathered to hear Andrea Dwork and speak to them about what they could do to, to um, change themselves and to make the world a better place for women. And she came and berated them and harangued them about their complicity in rape culture. I don't think she used the phrase, but that was definitely the idea because they hadn't ended rape even for one day. And that was the challenge that she launched to them. She said, if you really care you claim you're against rape, you claim you care about equality, you claim you care about women's safety, then end rape just for one day. Call off your side, call a truce mm. just for 24 hours. I mean, what do you, yeah. you know, and if they couldn't do that, well, then that showed that they were actually complicit. Right.
Yeah. And, you know, like, you just wish that some of the men had stood up and booed and walked out of such a ridiculous claim. But they didn't. And she was celebrated as a very important voice, um, talking about the reality of women's terror and their subjugation. And, uh, you know, and that has continued really, um, you know, rape culture is still a very popular term on university campuses. Supposedly all university campuses are rape cultures, even though, um, you know, university campuses are one of the safest places for women in the world, even in our societies that are generally rather safe and secure for, for most, at least middle and upper middle class women. Mm-hmm. So that's a potent emotional <laughs> argument, right? Like I observe that all of the yeah. Marxist, yeah, all of the, all of the Marxist sort of, uh, I'll call them theologies postulate a worldview of, of, of pure combat where, mm-hmm. you know, it's, it's not about the individual act. Like the, for example, ra- being called a racist, when you're called a racist today, it doesn't necessarily mean that you personally hold racist or prejudiced views. What it means is right. you participate in a larger system yes. of oppression whose existence cannot be proved, but has emotional potency, right? Yes. It sounds like rape mm-hmm. culture is kind of the same. Like I it would is. never rape any. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, you're, you're, you're doing a great job of explaining it. And, you know, there's that phrase, white silence is violence. It's the right. same idea there. If, if you are a white person, you therefore, by definition, are racially privileged and you are complicit in the subjugation of other peoples, especially black peoples. And if you don't speak out, if you don't bear that burden of guilt and castigate your own self and your own people for their racial complicity and violence, then you are part of the problem. And yeah, it's exactly the same thing. And and so, you know, and it's so terrible for young men hearing those kinds of accusations, because I think most young men, their first response is, geez, what, you know, wow, I never thought of myself in those ways. It has a visceral impact on the psyche and the emotions. Most young men are, um, you know, if not really, really interested in young women and willing to fall in love are at least benevolently disposed towards most women Mm -hmm. and don't want to see themselves as at war with women at all. Even gay men, you know, don't want to see themselves as at war with women. So the first reaction that I think most young men have is what can I do to escape from this intolerable identity that you're claiming I have, whether I want it or not. And the only way they can do that is to accept the identity and then pledge to work actively to spread the word to other men that they also must accept that abject identity, loathe it in themselves for the rest of their days. And the only way they can achieve even temporary redemption, it will never be full redemption, but at least temporary redemption is to work unceasingly for every single feminist goal that there is, whether that's affirmative action hiring, or whether it's the Me Too movement where any man accused must be assumed to be the predator that somebody is saying he is, or, you know, whether it's well, whatever it happens to be, you know, the, the particular policies that are going to be brought in at your workplace to advantage women and disadvantage men, you have to be for those. And only if you're enthusiastically for them can be you can you be excused of the the sin of your maleness, at least yeah. partially. I mean, it really is like a demonic religion in the sense that it's all about original sin, which is male. Yeah. And uh, the only way that you can, you can never really escape that original sin, but you can at least acknowledge it and, and repent of it and take whatever action you can uh, to be at least, you know, partially absolved of your guilt. It, it's just, it's a terrible, terrible thing. And of course, women don't have any sin because uh, they are the, the, the innocent, the sacrificial victims, allegedly throughout history, 
And they are also at the same time the, the savior goddesses who can point the way towards a better future. And so if, if men are willing to accept that for today and for next month and next year and maybe the next 10 years and maybe even for the rest of your life, you will have to take that secondary role, grieving your masculinity and begging for forgiveness. But maybe at some point in the future, uh, you know, the, the, the new world can come into being where at last you can live in harmony and equality with women. Because that is always, you know, that's the nice part of feminism is that they often promise, yes, there will come a time in the future when we will live as equals and you will finally be forgiven. But that will only happen when we say it will. And it will only happen when these, as you said, these imaginary, you know, these things that can't even be measured. We, when we decide that, the culture of woman hatred at last is over. And so you can come along and say, but look, women, women now make up 60% of university graduates. Women born after 1978 are actually doing better in the job market. The idea of the pay gap absolutely doesn't apply if you take out women who have children. And so if you look at single women compared to single men, single, single women are actually doing better in the job market. Their wages are better, their job positions are better, they're advancing more quickly. You know, you can point to all these measurable things, doesn't matter. There's still all these other things that the feminists will point to that mean you still have to feel bad about being male. Yes, it's I call it the feminist theology that women are cosmic victims and that men primarily must make restitution and participate in a work-based salvation for life. And you'll never actually get there. There is no, yeah. there is no point where a man can ever say like, I'm finally absolved because That's there's right. no universal alliance of women that can grant that. There's always right. another woman that you might have to apologize to. So it's a lifelong right. theological trap. <laughs> It is. It really is. So all you can do is you can buy a few indulgences <laughs> once in a while and, yeah. they, and they might work temporarily. But you're right that as soon as another accusation is made or some other issue is raised that you haven't been enthusiastically compliant about, um, then you're back to square one. Mm -hmm. it's, and you yeah, can... it's, a, it's a brilliant uh, it, it's it's a brilliant power play. And it's so brilliant in the sense that uh, we, I was just interviewing um, with Tom Golden. We interviewed Tim Golditch, uh, the author of Loving Men, Respecting Women, The Future of Gender Equality. And that's one of his big points is that um, women look with like laser vision and see all the ways in which they imagine that men are advantaged. They see the respect that high achieving men have earned. They see men in high positions and, and and they see men's physical power and indeed their, you know, um, spiritual or, or psychic power as well. But they don't ever recognize the various ways that women have power and exercise that power. And, you know, he names all these, these like he's actually enumerated the different types of power that women have that feminists never recognize as power. And it's a very different sort of power in general, but it is things like the power to shame. And, yes. uh, and, you know, that's an enormous power that women have probably always exercised over men. Maybe it's even, yes. I have a friend who thinks it was probably an evolutionary, like adaptive mechanism in that women shamed men because that was the way they made sure they got the resources that were necessary for them and their children to survive. You know, if we imagine like a caveman situation, so the woman is like, no, I need... I need this and that. And so uh, she would get it. And, and um, so, so, you know, and it had a utility perhaps then uh, and now it's been weaponized as a political ideology and it's very, very damaging. And it's something that's so difficult for a lot of men to resist. And the fact that men find it so difficult to resist gives the lie to the whole of patriarchy theory because if it were true that men dominated and oppressed women because they enjoy oppressing women, then all of women's complaints and pleas and demands would fall on deaf ears. And they never have, and they still don't, even though women have achieved political and economic equality you know, in, in our society and have had that for, for many years. Women can still say, no, there are all these various other ways that we're disadvantaged and men 
men listen and men listen partly because they want to listen because so many men love women and want to serve them and protect them and provide for them. And also because they do feel ashamed that it, it triggers that, that sense of, wow, that's terrible. What can I do to make it right? I have a whole hour long presentation that I did about this, that, um, that I am working to turn into a YouTube video exactly about what you talked about, how women have shaming power over men and how pervasive it is in society. And I root it back to uh, the idea that women actually control men, men's, we might say, uh, procreative destiny. And, right. and, you know, as we, as we, we're not used to living in big cities, like we're, we're not adapted necessarily in, in our, in our recent uh, racial history to live in big cities. We mostly lived in small villages and tribes, right? And, and not mm -hmm. too long ago. And so you as a man had a very limited pool of women to choose from about in a, in a hundred people, there might be, you know, 10 men or 10, 10 boys and 10 girls in a generation. And there's one for each. And if you as a man fail in your ability to woo a woman and she shames you, well, con congratulations, you now get your, either you fix that and now, or now you get a living death, right? To right. just watch yourself kind of die as you don't procreate. And that was the, that was the power that women had over men. You know, that was the power balance that men have physical power, testosterone, physical strength and size, but a woman can end a man's, we'll say genetic line or genetic de destiny. And that's the power balance. And so that's what kept, that's what keep, kept people being honest to each other. And so mm -hmm. now we see that same, that same weapon has been placed into the hands of women and they're, they're patted on the back and say, now go kill some men and, you know, run it out into social media and the movies and the media over the past 60, 70, 80 years. And voila, this is the world we live in. Yeah. It, it, I know that is, it's such a, such a key facet of what has happened over the last century. And yeah, it's, it, I had a, you know, a bit of a back and forth with a feminist on Twitter about that last week, I think. And, and, you know, I, I was just making the point that the white feather campaign, yes. um, which I think was used in both world wars, but was particularly prominent throughout the whole first world war, even yes. after, you know, conscription had been brought in and there was absolutely no need to shame men into enlisting. Uh, but women kept doing it obviously because they took great satisfaction in exercising that power. And there you couldn't have a more uh, vivid illustration of that power to shame, that men were actually willing to risk death, physical death on the battlefield in order to avoid that other, that evolutionary reproductive death, you called it. Uh, you know, that, yes, and, and you know, there it was. It, it was felt by boys of 14 who lied yeah. about their age and went and signed up and got blown up in the trenches of Europe. And by, uh, you know, even, even men sometimes who were home on leave had mm -hmm. the white feather uh, presented to them. They'd already proved their valor and yet they, they were still shamed by, by women presenting them with these feathers. And it's a horrible, horrible, not only illustration of that power, but, but of the, uh, something really quite terrifying in, in women yeah. that caused them to, to use that power and obviously to relish it. And yes. it was denied after the war. Virginia Woolf scoffed at it, said that she thought, you know, not more than, you know, a few dozen women had ever participated in the white feather campaign because of course her vision of women was that women were innocent victims. They wouldn't do right. such a thing. But we know from soldiers' letters, soldiers' personal accounts, um, from newspaper accounts at the time, it was participated by ten participated in by tens of thousands of women. I mean, it's just remarkable. Even when they knew that they were sending men off to unspeakable horrors. So yeah, yeah that's um, it, that's that's a big one, and it's never acknowledged. And when I mentioned it, you know, on, on Twitter, the woman who responded said, "Oh, come on, men were in charge of ev ev of everything in those days. Hmm. So couldn't they have, you know, did women really have any power? And I, you know, what can you say? Yeah, they had the power to shame. 
but that's still never do. recognized and they still do. Yeah. And it's. Yeah. The power to send the power to so thoroughly shame men that they will sign up to be sent into essentially like a, like a giant industrialized meat grinder, which is what world war yeah. one is like, we don't have a good yeah. perspective on what world war one was because we tend to lose it in the myths of world war two and the, the mythology behind world war two, like don't pay attention to that other war. But it was, I mean, when you actually read, I have, a, I have a, a video with a quote from Winston Churchill about world war one and how horrific it was and the many terrible ways that men died. Like that was how powerful that was. And so yeah. I think it's possible that some of those women were like, actually, and maybe this is a good time to talk about Valerie Solanus's book. Um, women enjoyed the power that they wielded over men to send men into their own self-destruction. Like there is mm -hmm. a component of that. Like, you know, it can it's not hard to imagine a woman knowing that with this feather, I can go send this man to die. And I don't have any responsibility for any of it because I haven't, I haven't shot him. I'm not the person who killed him. Right. That's I just, right. I just put a feather on him. Right. It's like plausible deniability mm -hmm. um, and, and revealing the uh, a potential vicious wickedness and an infernal nature in there that I think shows up in the scum manifesto. So maybe we can talk about this book real quick. Cause I'd yeah. never heard about it. I, until I wanted you told to say me. one more thing. Uh, sorry. Yeah, just please. about the, the, the interesting thing about the white feather campaign too, is that a lot of the women who had been suffragettes, in those in the years leading up to World War One, starting like in around 1907, 1908, the the uh, suffragette campaign, which was the campaign of of women, uh, you know, protesting their their uh, uh, exclusion from from suffrage, from from the right to vote, even though men, you know, men had there were many men who couldn't vote at the same time. And that was never a part of the suffragette campaign. I mean, it's incredible. Right. Um, you know, there were still property and income qualifications in Great Britain that uh, excluded up to 40% of the British male population from the right to vote. Those men had to go off and die or be maimed for life in the trenches was still without the right to vote, but women were really angry that they didn't have that right. So, um, so they, they, um, like many of those same women that uh, participated in in a uh, arson and bombing campaign that went all across the United Kingdom, they burned country homes to the ground. They set off bombs all over the place. They 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 started with letter bombs. They put them in post boxes, and when the um, postal workers would be sorting out the mail. It was like a combination of, I forget what two chemicals, but it would then ignite and they burned uh, men's hands, caused terrible fires on trains, all, you know, wow. all, just all sorts of mayhem uh, that was justified by their sense of righteous outrage that they were being denied their rights by a patriarchy. And so they were quite happy to attack men, many of whom were just, you know, powerless working men. Um, so it was those same women, you know, powered by this rage that then all of a sudden switched over. They stopped the suffragette campaign during the war, but they then participated in the white feather movement, which was another way for them to exert their psychosocial female power and to express their rage against men. And so I think that is, I mean, that's why... I'm, I mean, that's my, my thing really that I'm doing now is, is, is trying to write a, a whole history of feminist thought, not, not so much a history of the feminist movement, which would be, you know, that would be, have to be an enormous tome, but mm. I thought a, a history of feminist thought, because I really want men and well, men and women to understand that this hatred, that the intense anti-male animus, the conviction of women's righteous, you know, moral innocence, and in fact, moral superiority, that it's, it was there right from the very beginning, so that we can stop thinking that there was anything ever decent, anything genuinely committed to equality in feminism at any point, because I hear that so much, even amongst people who are anti-feminist or non-feminist today, and they'll say, well, feminism went too far. 
and you know it, it turned against men it became radical and they'll locate it somewhere maybe it started in the 1960s that it went radical or maybe they even think that was a pretty good movement it got really right. bad in the 1980s when it became intersectional or maybe it got really bad in the early 21st century when it got into you know trans activism and uh, radical queer theory and hatred of of heterosexuality and and everything but but actually the, the the reality is that if you go all the way back to 1792 if you want to start with Mary Wollstonecraft if you look at 1848 the Seneca Falls convention when american women sort of you know named their grievances and had the first women's convention and a bunch of women and men signed a list of demands including the right to vote or if you look at the suffrage movement which is often seen as a very reasonable movement all they were asking for was the right to vote nope always in in involved in their arguments was this intense hatred this incredible resentment where they would say as they said in the uh, Seneca Falls convention that the entirety of the history of mankind was the history of injury and usurpation practiced deliberately with the end of establishing an absolute tyranny of man over woman. They would never admit that there was anything in the whole history of humankind that showed that men had ever acted benevolently towards women, that men had ever been animated by a desire to protect women and children in the building of civilization. None of that was ever mentioned. I haven't found a single feminist who had a good thing to say about men in any of her statements. It's, mm -hmm. it's just incredible. And yeah, maybe the culmination of that is Valerie Solanas, although she's only one amongst, uh, right. amongst many. Yeah, I mean, she actually gets into anti-male exterminationism, which is also a, a, a strand of, of feminist philosophy or feminist thought that uh, is very popular in the 60s, 70s, 80s. And, you know, again, whenever I mention this, if I mention this on Twitter, somebody always come forward and say, oh, yeah, well, that was just one person or that was a fringe you know, she was just a, and they'll say this about Solanus. Oh yeah, she was just a, she was a crazy woman. She had a, you know, she, she was, she was mentally ill when she wrote that, that text, the Scum Manifesto, which yeah, she was. Yes. She, yes. Yeah, clearly. But the, the interesting thing about that is that if you read the Scum Manifesto and people don't have to read the whole thing, it's short too, but yeah. you don't even have to read the whole thing. Just read the first 10 pages and then skip through and read little bits here and there. Uh, you know, it's, it's, um, much of it sounds quite familiar, the, the kinds of claims she makes. It's not that radical, maybe just a little bit more radical than a lot of stuff that you still hear regularly. She says mm -hmm. that it is rational for women to hate men, but it's totally irrational for men to hate women. She says that men hate women because they're eaten up with envy because they recognize that women are superior to men. She says that women are superior to the to men in the same way that human beings are superior to dogs. And then she takes that a little bit further and says that uh, you know to exterminate men, which she advocates somewhat tongue in, tongue in cheek maybe hard to say, uh, to exterminate men because men are such thoroughly miserable, contemptible creatures is an act of benevolence. Mm -hmm. And well, you know, it's kind of crazy, but all that stuff about how men hate women because men are envious of women and women's hatred of men is actually rational and understandable and justifiable. That's still a mainstream part of feminist thought. You encounter it in many feminist statements today. And, uh, and the fact that she then went on to try to kill a man, well, to kill a number of men actually in the following yeah. year after she wrote the SCUM Manifesto. And for anybody who doesn't know, SCUM stands for the Society for Cutting Up Men. And that was the whole idea that women should get together and go out as sort of vigilantes and, you know, just rid the world of all those terrible creatures. Uh, she then, you know, the next following year tried to kill Andy Warhol. Um, she th shot yeah. him three times and nearly did kill him. I think he was pronounced dead 
when uh, when he was found at the scene, but he was revived. He had to wear a, a kind of girdle for the rest of his life to keep his organs in place because the uh, the uh, bullets had, had penetrated so many of his different organs. She also tried to kill an art critic that he was with and his manager as well, but uh, yeah. she didn't manage, she wounded the art critic and she didn't manage to hit the, the manager. And the thing about it was that this was not, she's never been disavowed as a feminist foremother. She was celebrated in the day, the uh, head of the National Organization of Women, the uh, New York chapter said that this was uh, an act of feminist justice and hired the most expensive lawyer she could find to to defend her. Um, Her book has been reprinted uh, in a very boutique press version uh, with a glowing and gushing introduction by a feminist scholar named Avital Ronell, who talks about how prescient it, it is and you know gushes about it in the most disgusting manner. I know it's taught in many women's studies classes. There's a biography of, of uh, Solanus by a woman named Brianne Foz, who talks about her both as a victimized innocent and as a you know glorious revolutionary was striking a blow against the patriarchy. So this is the kind of person that mainstream feminism is quite happy to celebrate as a foremother. I mean, it's as if you know men's rights activists celebrated uh, Elliot Rogers' online manifesto. Yeah, uh, you know, like the the discrepancy. You know, yet. Any, any man who speaks up on behalf of his fellow men is accused of hating women, even if he never, ever, ever expresses any such hatred. And yet women's hatred is, is explained away or, or given a pass or, or even, um, even condoned or, or celebrated. There is a new book out by a woman called um, Mona El Tahawi. I don't know if you've come across her. Mm-hmm. It's called The... It's worth looking at, too. It really is. Um, It's called The Seven Necessary Sins for Women and Girls. One of the sins is, now now I'm forgetting whether it's, she calls it anger or rage. Anyway, she has a whole chapter on, on women's justified violence against men. And she argues with a straight face and with citations of, you know, legal theorists and various philosophers that the only way women will ever create the just society that they have so long been denied is to actually start engaging in violence against men, what she calls justified violence. And she has a fantasy in that book where she says, imagine if we just started executing men here and there, and then it would grow. And first it would be five men a week in one country. And then pretty soon it would be 50 men a week. And then pretty soon across various countries, it would be 500 men a week. And we would say to the patriarchy, we're just going to keep on doing this until you finally listen and act on our demands. And so here we are in 2019, And we still have women celebrating the idea of killing men. And it's a book that's been, you know, widely celebrated. She's done book tours across Australia, Canada. I think she actually lives in Canada now. And um, she's, yeah, a celebrated feminist luminary uh, who is understood to have many important things to teach women and girls. I mean, I just, I find it astounding that that is acceptable. And, and she is one in a line of um, powerful feminist advocates and academics who have said things equally as disturbing. Um, there was a woman named Sally Miller Gearhart, who in the 1980s wrote an article called The Future, If There Is One, is Female. And she there said that women should harness the power of new reproductive technologies to make sure that they could reduce the population of male human beings to 10% of the entirety of the human race so that at last we could live at peace and 
you know, without violence, etc. This was an academic and a widely celebrated one. Nobody bats an eye that that essay was published in the 1980s. She actually just died recently and, and you know, received glowing encomia. Um, Mary Daly, a uh, theology professor at Boston University, agreed with her that the population of males would have to be reduced in some manner, non-violently, of course. Of course. You know, <laughs> they weren't actually recommending that you just cut them down in the street, but that, that it would need to be, men would have to have their numbers radically reduced to effect what Daly called a decontamination of the earth. <laughs> And, uh, yep. Yeah, so that's, that is that those are the heirs of Solanus. They, they were not diagnosed with any mental illness or, uh, you know, declared mad. They, they, they taught students for decades and, um, and that is the core of feminist ideology. So it's, mm -hmm. yeah, that's, so, you know, that's, um, I guess like I'm, I'm, I, I don't, you know, I, I don't, uh, I don't, I'm not sure where, how we go about now really responding to the, the, the culture of hatred that has been created. Um, because although like, I know people who feel quite hopeful and who think that the, the tide is turning and, you know, that a lot of people are, are, are at last turning against feminism I, uh, I'm not sure. I mean, I, I think that if you wanted to uh, really harm society, you couldn't have done better than, than what feminism has done. And, and like it, the harm is so profound that it's, it's sometimes kind of overwhelming to think yeah. about it. You know, so many men have been alienated because their best impulses, their, their most benevolent, um, desires and ambitions have been uh, have been perverted and and you know they've been shamed for them as we said and on the other side I think women have been harmed by having the encouragement of women's worst worst <laughs> not best worst instincts and and impulses our our discontent our uh, vainglory, our narcissism, like all those I think are really exacerbated and affirmed by a feminist culture, even if it isn't, you know, called feminism, just the whole culture of you go girl, you're perfect just the way you are. And don't let anybody ever tell you that you need to improve in any aspect of your life because you're just great the way you are. Um, you know, and that idea that any time a woman is criticized for anything that that's in itself sexist in some way and she's perfectly justified in not only ignoring it but maybe even amplifying whatever the thing was that was being criticized you know campaigns like ban bossy as if it's a good thing if people if women are bossy because anything that women do even if it's violent and destructive and mean-spirited is somehow empowering like all of that i think is you know, and just the refusal to admit that that there could be anything in women that would need to be curbed or channeled in you know in a in a productive rather than a destructive direction. So all of that I think has been really harmful for women, and and it has created such a tremendous divide between men and women that uh, yeah, it's just it's it's quite dispiriting at times, but. Uh, so I guess, you know, the one thing I feel like I can contribute really is to, because I spent so many years reading all of these theorists and, and, uh, I, I do feel I, I know them in a way that very few even feminists do. And the, the feminists who do know them and what they stand for aren't telling. And yeah. so I feel like I'm one of the few who, who actually knows what they said, right? back in 1792 and I'm, I'm putting it into a book and, and I hope that will encourage people. Um, because I, I know that, you know, whenever someone says, oh, I think we have to get away from this feminist idea, then someone will always come back and say, so you're saying that you're an, you know, you're saying you're opposed to women's rights. You're saying you don't care if women are harmed and you know, all that kind of thing. And, and so what I want to show is that there, 
there never was a benign feminism that was ever not really, really angry and ever not interested in destroying the social order in order to remake it in a, in a utopian guise. It was always anti-family and it made that quite clear. Even like Elizabeth Cady Stanton, who was the major leader of the American women's movement from the mid 19th century on, she has, she has um, lectures that she gave at, at private venues where she called for um, basically no fault divorce. You know, she felt that um, marital unions should be able to be dissolved at will and that that would make everybody so much happier. She never mm -hmm. really seemed to think about what, what would be the fate of children uh, who would have their families broken up by this dissolution. Uh, you know, that was as early as the 1870s. There were free love advocates on the radical wing of the feminist movement from the mid 19th century. So all of these ideas about destroying the family, seeing the family as the site of women's oppression, um, representations of male sexuality as fundamentally, they didn't use the word toxic, but that's essentially what they were saying. That was there in the very early days of the movement too. So all the elements that we see now were already there. So there was never a time when it was about equality and nobody could ever really say what equality was anyway, because as we know, it just, there is no such thing. Men and women are not equal in that sense. Of course, they're of equal value, but uh, you know, what, is, what does it mean to say that they're equal? And, and this was the, there's a wonderful, uh, well, an interesting anyway, uh, uh, philosopher, barrister, um, and journalist named Ernest Belfort Bax, who wrote a couple of books in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. One was called The Fraud of Feminism. Mm. And that was one of the things he pointed out that it was feminism was always fundamentally incoherent. And yet that was its strength. <laughs> and, and what he meant by that was that on the one hand, feminists would always say women are perfectly as capable as men of doing you know, anything at all. And so any uh, area of society where women aren't equally represented, that was evidence of discrimination. We still hear that today, right? If yes. you look at STEM fields and there's still one, you know, where men <laughs> uh, outnumber women, that must be because of discrimination, not because of different abilities or different interests or different inclinations. Right. So they, that was always the argument. But then on the other side, the argument was women are different from men. Women need special protections. Women are morally superior to men. They're less capable of violence. They have special mothering abilities and responsibilities. And so we need to always be concerned, you know, whenever they express a concern or a fear or a dissatisfaction, we need to make sure that we change policies or laws in order to to you know, secure their their comfort and their well being. So always those two things. He called one sentimental feminism, the one about how women are different and need special treatment, and the other was political feminism, how women are actually just as good as men and need, you know need all these 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 equal rights. And yeah, it's still like that today. And um, and it just it seems to have lost none of its power. Uh, and yet as a political movement, it's very, very destructive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the, the combination, uh, that's a great distinction, sentimental versus political feminism. It's sort of a one-two punch. You know, you have the appeal to emotion on one side, and then you have that seems to legitimize the rage that then exacts yes. itself as vengeance in the political, cultural, and even, you know, and even personal social sphere. Like these yeah. ideas... You know, these intellectual ideas are not consequence free. They don't live in a bubble. They show up in people's homes and their families yeah. and their relationships. And that's where the sharp point gets driven into men. It's not yeah. necessarily just in Captain Marvel or whatever in a Marvel TV show. It's like it shows up in men's marriages. It shows up yeah. the way that women treat their their young sons. And I, I don't think it's impossible to draw a straight line from kill all men to castrate my son. Like mm -hmm. I don't, I don't, and the, the transgender phenomenon is primarily, yes. you know, through children is boys transitioning to girls. And mm -hmm. I think that those, I think those two things are very connected. 
Well, when you read, uh, there are all sorts of feminist treatises on the internet or just, you know, like op-eds and newspapers and that sort of thing by feminist mothers talking about their fears that their son is going to turn out to be a rapist, yep. their determination that they're going to, you know, drill into their son from the time he's two or three years old, that he's not to look at girls, that yep. he's, you know, not to do this, that he can harm girls just by looking at them, you know, all that stuff like, wow. I mean, it, it's horrifying to think of what kind of a awful guilt trip these mothers are determined to lay on their sons. And yes, their revulsion at the very idea of masculinity. Well, it wouldn't be surprising then if that little boy is going to say, yeah, well, I want to be a girl. And then the mother who thinks that masculinity is evil is going to encourage it for sure. So yeah, it's it does have these massive personal consequences mm -hmm. and, and disrupting marriages as well. Yeah. Yeah. So um, just a, do you have time for another question or two? Yeah, sure. Okay, perfect. So, so um, do you get, okay. So, so, so the people, the men and women who listen to this podcast, I think are, are people who are looking for a bridge to come into reconciliation. In fact, I know that that's the case. And so there will always be some hardened amount of women that will never put down the sword. They, 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 they like the sword. They feel like they need to carry the sword, yeah. whatever that is. But I, I think the women, particularly the women who listen to this podcast, they're either in the process of putting down the sword, they want to put down the sword, or they want to make amends for the sword carrying that they did. They're in some process of transition of coming back into reconciliation with men. I'm very proud to, to speak to women like that. I'm very honored that they, they listen to me. So what, what advice would you give women that are <laughs> on that, in that process of sort of making amends. I know that you're not a counselor or a therapist. I, I understand that, but, but from your own experience, perhaps you've met girls or women like this, you know, perhaps, you know, some in your own life, perhaps you've even influenced some with your writing and your work to think in that way, what advice or, or what guidance would you give them? Yeah, this is, I, I'm not very good. I don't think That's uh, fine. I'm not, I'm not good at giving advice. Um, I mean, I, I, I guess I would just, I would just counsel, uh, acts of empathy. I think would be the main thing I would say. And at least that's what happened to me. Um, it was that I, I did put myself in, in men's shoes. And I think, uh, you know, we see all sorts of still like public demonstrations of men being asked to put themselves in women's shoes as if men don't do that, as if men don't ever think about what women need or want. And you see firemen or policemen parading around in high heeled shoes as if that uh, <laughs> helps them in some way. Um, Maybe too literal, put yourself in a woman's shoes. Like, something. yeah, yeah, that too. Yeah. 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 Well, well, yeah, yeah. They prance around while women stand at the sideline cheering them on. Um, mm. and, and, but so, yeah, I don't think that any physical demonstration is necessary, but, but, uh, that that was what worked for me was just thinking what it must be like to be told from the time you can even first start imagining who you are as a human being that there's something wrong with you because of the sex you were born into that that has been the effect of feminism on on men and so i would encourage women to yeah maybe talk to the men or the, especially the young men in their, in their lives about what it feels like to be told those things and to be accused and to be held responsible for violence and inequality and war and everything that's wrong. Uh, now, I think that like what maybe the feminist response is that, I mean, they'll, they'll deny that they even do it. They'll say, no, when we talk about toxic masculinity, we're talking about freeing men from, you know, Right. things that harm them just as much as they harm women. And, you know, it sounds good, but the man box, um, sorry, the man box is what they yes, call the man that. box. It's going to be yeah. so liberating when you the, learn to cry and, and all of that. Right. Um, yeah. Like, I think the reason that that's justified often is that feminists really do, or even women who not don't necessarily consider themselves feminists. They, they believe that, that 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 was what women were told for so many years 
Mm-hmm. And so I think it, it, it well, for one thing, and, and let's say, okay, let's grant that it was, let's say that up until 1970, women were, women were um, belittled in some way or made to feel inferior, made to feel that certain types of achievement were um, more masculine than feminine, let's say. Mm-hmm. I mean, I really find it hard to even say that because I just right. know it, it wasn't true. But let's say it was. Uh, it's still completely wrong to put any of that back on on boys. It's that that is just that is class vengeance, and there has never been a better society created by making any group of people have to bear responsibility for the alleged or real sins of their fathers or the preceding generations that never has led to anything good at all. Mm -hmm. So even if it were true that up until 10 years ago, women were discriminated against and told they were inferior, it wouldn't be any good to make boys feel guilt over that. And the other thing is that, yeah, it it isn't true. As I found out when I was researching 19th century women writers, I researched one woman named Sarah Jeanette Duncan. She was born in 1864 and she became a journalist. She wrote for the the Globe newspaper, which eventually became the Globe and Mail, which still exists. Mm -hmm. She wrote for the Washington Post. She lived in Washington for a year. She wrote reviews and social commentary as a very, very young woman. She started when she was in in her early 20s and uh, eventually became a novelist and lived in India with her husband, who was an Indian uh, civil servant. And and she said of the 1880s that it was a golden age for girls full of new opportunities and I forget the other word, enterprise or something like that. Mm -hmm. She felt that, you know, anything was possible for women. She had never been made. She grew up in an ordinary, you know, Canadian lower middle class family, had an okay education, uh, the Brantford Collegiate. Um, But she felt anything was possible and all her friends did things with their lives. One of her friends became a university professor. One of her friends became a doctor. She interviewed them in the pages of the Globe newspaper. Uh, so this notion that, you know, up until very, very recently, there was a patriarchal conspiracy to tell women that they, you know, couldn't be whatever they would want to be. Yes, maybe there were some individual cases, but it was not this widespread thing. Um, yeah, so I, I guess that that would be my advice, I guess, is to doubt to doubt everything that you hear about the past that was supposedly so terrible for women to have suspicion about what the Betty Friedans and the Gloria Steinems tell us about what it was like in the 1950s or 1960s, to wonder why there were so many women who managed to achieve wonderful things if it was, if there was this horrible conspiracy. And then to reflect that even if it were all true, that wouldn't in any way justify visiting it on today's men and boys. And what about for what about for those men and boys? Because that's kind of partially my story is I got some of those beliefs, like don't ever look at a woman, all that, until I went and I traveled down to South America. And I met the women in South America who were expecting that kind of behavior. And they were very direct about that. And it was like, I realize that these feminist ideas are not absolute theological as theological absolutes, that it's very culturally determined. And that was very, that was very interesting. It was very interesting to me. It was a big awakening moment to recognize, oh, wait a minute. Like I was told that this is the way that it is around the world. But, you know, the, the people that I was meeting in, in South America particularly are like, no, it's not like that at all. Like it's mm-hmm. and it was a re- big awakening. So not every man has the opportunity to travel to South America. What would you say to some of the men and boys that have grown up? I mean, really of all ages. So you can see you can run this out from you know, men in their 40s or 50s, or perhaps even older at this point, down to young boys. Yeah. Like, what like what would you offer to the men who are listening? Who uh, and again, I, I recognize that advice isn't mm-hmm. necessarily, but you have a you have a unique insight into these these thought waves, these rivers of, of ideas, and the consequences to them in a way that you can diagnose the illness. And there is some there is something to that because most people can't even see the illness in the first place. 
So as someone who's able to diagnose the illness, who's able to diagnose the poison, maybe what would, what would you say to some of the men who are listening, who, who are experiencing these things? Yeah, I don't know what to say. I mean, I, I, I just, I think of my friend, Tom Golden's motto, which is that men are good as mm -hmm. are you. He always says that when he opens his, uh, his programs and, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I, I just, I would say to men that I, if you feel, uh, as I expect many of your viewers do, if you feel baffled by the, you know, just the, the ever present, it seems, culture of anti-male animus, the dislike, the contempt, the indifference, the hatred, I feel it too. That's all I can really say. It's astounding. It is so, it is so weird to me to, to see it. And I can only imagine how terrible it must be to, to, to maybe have grown up one's entire life, as you say, even into one's sixties now, feeling that, or maybe vaguely remembering a time 40 years ago when it didn't seem to be quite so bad and then feeling it getting worse and worse and worse over the years and with no let up in sight. Uh, it, it is, to me, it's just truly bizarre. And, and when I started my video series, I, that's what I wanted to, that was my only message really. It wasn't so much for women, it was actually for men. And it was just to say, if you think that our present culture is, obscene and 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 pathological it, you're right it is it isn't you it's this weird thing that that we allowed to be created and it is wrong that's that's all i can really say no that's a, that's a blessing because there are, there are many women that are afraid to say even that Right. It's a, because they recognize that it's speaking out against a the theology that I think American culture kind of takes for granted. You can't you can't question that notion of cosmic victimization. That's the mm. that's I think that's the final idol. The last big boss idol yeah. in America is to question that. Yeah. Well, you've been so generous with your time. I, I just I, I just have one more question, which is that imagine there's somebody who's like just on the cusp of, say, swallowing this particular red pill. Of, of seeing feminism for what it is, right? I can't believe it. I can't, I don't believe it. No, I don't want to believe it, but they, but there's something in them that's calling them forward. Is there a book or a resource that you would recommend to them? That's like, take a look at this, read this, and then, and then get back to me. Is there, no, is there, some, huh? <laughs> there's, there's a many. few good books. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of good books out there. Um, well, pro I, I don't know that I'd have one that anyone else wouldn't have already recommended. Probably like I've, I found Warren Farrell's writings really helpful, like especially the myth of male power, yeah. where he really goes through and says, okay, we see this as, as, as evidence of male power, but then you have to consider that X, Y, and Z as well. And we imagine women as disempowered in these ways, but you know, here are forms of female power. I, f I found that really, really useful and it's very beautifully lucidly written. So I would recommend that. I would also recommend Daphne Patai's book, Heterophobia, sexual harassment and the future of feminism. It was written in the late nineties and written mostly about the earlier nineties and the late eighties when all the sexual harassment discussion and policies and, you know, sort of the prohibition on all the ways that men could harm women just by talking to them at work, you know, or giving a compliment on a woman's hair. Uh, she shows that all that stuff that we that allegedly had never been talked about, you know, before Me Too, it was all, you know, it had, it had started happening in the late '80s, early '90s. I mean, Anita Hill and uh, mm -hmm. Clarence Thomas was in 1993, mm. and there was an explosion of talk about, you know, alleged sexual harassment. And she really gets at how what what is involved in it is this what she calls heterophobia, hatred of the pair bond between men and women, and a determination to break it by claiming that everything about male heterosexuality is damaging and oppressive. And wow. I, she does a fantastic job. She has a whole section on feminist thought as well, and you know how it contributed to the, these ideas. And she gives all sorts of evidence of 
men, you know, broken and destroyed by ridiculous claims at schools, universities, in their workplaces. I, you know, it it shows there's nothing new about what's going on now. It's been going on for 30 or 35 years. It's, it's a really great book. She's a feminist. I think she still calls herself a feminist, but a definitely a a very dissident one. It's a really good book. And then I would also, I would recommend uh, Christina Hoff Summers book, mm. Who Stole Feminism, which again is an early book. I forget the exact date, 1990 something. And, uh, you know, she just goes through all the studies that allegedly proved that, you know, so many, uh, one in four women have been raped. That was a study done by Mary Koss that was published in Ms. Magazine in the 1980s. And, you know, she just finds, she shows all the the faulty data, the sleights of hand, the fudging of statistics and, mm-hmm. and all of that. And it's just really, really helpful. All the things that we take for granted about the pay gap and the this and that, uh, she she looks at how how those things originated and, and shows the ways in which they're false. So that's that's really helpful too. I guess those would be my, my big three. That's great. Yeah. Fun fact, the first cover of Ms. Magazine, I think that's, that was Gloria Steinem's magazine, yes. right? Ms. Mm-hmm. The, I think it was the first cover of Ms. Magazine. One of the first three covers uh, showed a picture of the, the Hindu goddess Kali. That's always, that's holding a man's head covered in blood. Like that was, that was like one of the first covers. Like they weren't nice, hiding. Eh? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah real, I know. Really, exactly. Yeah. I know. I mean, that that's the thing that's so interesting, you know, that someone like Steinem, she was, yeah, she was radical as she, yeah. uh, her vision of, of patriarchy was, it was hideous. It was exaggerated. It was clear. It was all it completely biased against men. And yet she somehow emerged and made a really lucrative, I assume, career mm. out of being the, the smiling face of an allegedly, um, you know, reasonable movement. I think partly just because she was photogenic and nice looking and, uh, you know, spoke fairly Odd. well. And everyone thought, oh, well, if Gloria Steinem's for it, it must be reasonable. But it, it, as you say, it it never was. Yeah. There's some irony about that, right? Like the, the, the nice looking face of the movement that's rejecting all these kind of beauty standards and stuff like that, mm-hmm. right? If yeah. they really had the courage of their convic- convictions, <laughs> they'd bring Andrea Dworkin out for more things. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> In her overalls. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah exactly, exactly. Well, this has been absolutely brilliant, Janice. Thank you so much. And uh, do you have anywhere that you'd like to send people to find out more about you and what you do, your Twitter account, maybe, or a page on Amazon? Uh, well, my the big thing I'm doing now is I've started a Substack newsletter, mm. and I would be delighted if anybody would like to, uh, I, you know, take a free subscription. I don't, I don't encourage anybody to have to pay for it. I would just be happy to have you read my uh, my Substack newsletter, and it's just called Fiamengo File, all one word, F I A M E N G O, Fiamengo File dot Substack dot com. That'll bring it up and yeah, take out a free subscription. I have a very robust comment section, lots of interesting people giving their views. And I try to write there like at least once a week, um, just on different topics of the day. And uh, so, yeah, I would love that if, if people would come on and, uh, and join that. They will find that link in the description. Great. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Janice. Well, thanks very much.